everybody, it's Chris here from Lifeline EMS Training. We're going to keep going with our COPD series and go to part two. So part two, and as you can tell here by the O and COPD, so chronic, all the time, obstructive, blocking the normal process, pulmonary of the lungs disease. So adopted, adapted by the body uh, outside of its normal function. The O here <clears throat> is a picture of a constricted, swollen, inflamed with lung butter bronchial. So, of course, we're going to be talking about chronic bronchitis. So, chronic bronchitis is sticky tubes. So, just like with asthma, essentially, we have bronchial inflammation and increased mucus production. So, what is the definition of chronic bronchitis? It's a person who experiences bron bronchitis for three or more months in a row, two or plus years in a row. So imagine that. Imagine what's going to happen if you have bronchitis, right? You have swollen, inflamed bronchioles. You have increased mucus production. And you're constantly have to <laughs> cough that up and get it out. Think about the amount of work, the amount of sitting upright, the amount of coughing, the amount of energy it's going to take, diaphragm function it's going to take to get that up and out of you. And you're doing this for three or more months in a row for two or more years in a row. That's a lot of work. That's a really bad place to be in. So again, <clears throat> our recap here, it's those goblet cells that are increasing the production of the lung butter and the inflammation of the wall and the constriction, the irritation of those bronchioles that's triggering this chronic bronchitis state, this chronic inflammation of the bronchioles state. So narrow tubes requires more work of breathing because you're trying to bring gas in past that resistive narrow passage. So these individuals are working hard to breathe. So what do they have? Like, what's their lung sounds going to sound like? Well, remember that lung butter, that gunkiness? We're going to be moving air past that sticky nastiness. So when they're breathing, we're going to kind of hear that, not crackly like pulmonary edema, but that gunky kind of poppy sound as the air moves past that sticky flypaper area. And then you may also hear wheezing, right? Because they're inflamed, their tubes, their lumen is inflamed. So you may hear wheezing, you may hear crunchy wheezing from the ronchi, but the ronchi and the bronchi are the mucus and the wheezing is that constriction or inflammation that's narrowed that passage to make that train whistle sound. So the lung sounds can vary depending on the person. Last one I had, the person had wheezing and real bad ronchi. And they actually had worse ronchi on one side because what triggered the event was they actually had a pneumonia on their right lo upper lobe. And so it was very dense and gunky there from the increased or enhanced mucus production. And then they were wheezy, slightly wheezy throughout. And then we also heard ronchi in their other fields from their chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the chronic bronchitis they have all the time. So it actually sounded worse in the right upper part because they also had an infection on top of it. So on top of this normal overarching response or this arching immune-like response, they had a true infection in that moment as well that was making or exacerbating the problem in that one area. So what makes that wheeze? It's the squeeze, right? And let's use the whoopee cushion as an example. When you think of a whoopee cushion, you fill it up, you fill it up real quick. And then a person sits on it. And because of the resistance of that pinch point, that bronchoconstriction, it goes, makes that wheeze over a longer period of time. So the pinching is that bronchoconstriction. That's what makes the wheeze is that bronchial constriction. So what do we constantly hear the term, right? Blue bloater. Now you're not going to get on the radio and mark up on the scene with a blue bloater, but blue bloater is the thing that you hear because they are in states of uh, hypoxia. They're usually obese. <clears throat> and the hypoxia really stems from the fact that because they're chronically constricted in their bronchioles, 
they're constantly working harder, gobbling up oxygen, right? Increasing their respiratory rate, increasing their accessory muscle use, increasing their positioning to get past that resistance, to move gas in through that resistance. But because that bronchial is constricted, they also have that retention in the alveoli because they're not able to fully exhale the last amount of gas up and out. So they constantly have that in state of engorgement. You'll see barrel chesting. The barrel chesting is because the volume in their lungs stays higher than normal because they're not able to well or fully ventilate or exhale. So what actually happens is the lungs, because their volume expands, starts to push up and out on that rib cage. And then they get club fingers, club fingers, you'll actually see increased tissue under the nail beds and they'll be blue cyanotic. So those are come, some of the tall tale signs of a chronic bronchitis COPD patient. What would they look like on your monitor? Well, <clears throat> because they're having that increased workload, and that increased stress, and the body's trying to combat that, they're going to be a little tachycardic. They may be on the upper end of normal as their baseline. Their SPO2s are traditionally lower. And so this goes back to part of the assessment with COPD is, hey, what's your normal? If they normally walk around at 92%. That doesn't mean you need to race down the hall, grab all the oxygen you can, come back and give it to them. If their normal is 92 and you get them at 94 they're saturating pretty well. If you their normal is 92 and they're 88, yeah, they might need some supplementation. So find out what their normal is. Respiratory rate in this instance is up at 20 and titles on the higher end of normal at 44. And their blood pressure, what's your normal blood pressure, right? In these instances, they're always in that stressed state. They usually tend to run high, even with the medications. Now look here on that end title, you have that patented bronchoconstricted rounding here of the C phase. So that shark finning, if you will. So this person has that bronchoconstriction. They're breathing a little on the upper end of fast. SATs 94, but that might be normal for them. Uh, but it is definitely lower than what we're used to in terms of comfort of normal. Heart rate is up a little bit. And even though that's not tachycardic, that's, that's the higher end of normal, right? You shouldn't be sitting down with a resting heart rate of 96 because over time, you're going to remodel your heart. And if you're asking the heart muscle to work at a higher rate, right? Always constantly be in a state of workout. It's going to change the modeling or the structure of your heart over time, which is why you also tend to see COPD patients with heart failure problems later because of that restrictive process causing that stress work on the heart to compensate for it. So we very rarely see somebody experiencing only one of these conditions. They usually have multiple conditions. What's our treatment? Well, primarily we want to help open them up, right? So we can nebulize that albuterol. Of course, we can assist them with their inhaler and make sure it's the rescue inhaler, not the maintenance inhaler. But we use or go about it with the albuterol. We try and open up those bronchial smooth muscles, decrease that inflammation, and then help with the cessation or stopping of the lung butter production with the atrovent. So those are our go-to. Most, most use uh, two 2.5 milligram albuterol bullets for a total of five with a 0.5 milligram atrovent bullet. And they nebulize that between six to eight liters per minute until the medication's gone and then reassess. And when you talk about reassessing, what are you reassessing? Well, you're looking at their pulse ox and you're hoping that's going up. You're looking at their respiratory rate and you hope that's going down so their work of breathing is getting less. Listen to those lung sounds. Are they moving more air? Are they getting louder and better? lungs are getting quieter, that's not a good thing. It means they're getting tighter and moving less air. Now with albuterol, you expect the heart rate to go up a little bit. Natriven also helps that. So it's not uncommon to give somebody a nebulizer and have the heart rate jump up a handful of beats a minute because you're giving them a stimulant. These things are stimulants to the sympathetic nervous system. So it's not uncommon to see that heart rate go up. So after you give those medications, do your reassessment, listen to lung sounds, hopefully you're clearing them up and you're getting more sounds and you're seeing the appropriate pulse oximetry at end tidal changes as well. As always, have any questions, hit us up at info at lifelineemstraining.com. Hope you have a great day.